Well, good morning. Um, before I get started on the first aim in using population health data and measurement, I do want to set the stage a little bit with a few comments on the need to balance between these three aims due to our current state in Canada, uh, which to me seems a little bit unbalanced. So um, just to refresh your memory, I'll know, I know this is worded a few different ways, but basically the triple aim uh, that we're focusing on are uh, listed up on the slide here. And I am going to suggest that our current state uh, maybe suggests we've lost our way a little bit. Um, is constraining cost really the overarching aim? And followed a bit by the provider experience, and then by enhancing the patient experience, or at least when it gets more votes, with the occasional nod provided from time to time to population health, or at least talking about population health. Why is healthcare costing more and more, and why is this sort of an overarching aim? Well, perhaps it's uh, due to rising healthcare wage costs, and often for many of the disciplines, these wage costs are increasing faster than average wages or wages in the rest of society. Uh, more and more expensive drugs and treatment costs, uh, but for those extra costs, we're getting smaller and smaller marginal returns more and more expensive diagnostic tests given, and a lot due to increasing patient demand and fear from providers of litigation if these aren't provided. Or in some cases, I would suggest a, a, bit, of, a, a bit of increased individualism where we're caring mostly about our own silos and from a patient perspective about um, uh, the impact on me individually or my family member, not necessarily thinking about the opportunity costs of uh, uh, the, uh, the unbalanced system. And also, I would suggest there is uh, perhaps an effort to paint the crisis in rising healthcare costs, uh, perhaps a bit artificially. Maybe it's artificially created, or at least in part, perhaps overrepresented uh, as unsustainable because what we've done is um, uh, created instability by definition. And in a room that's probably full of a lot of analysts, I don't have to remind you that there are numer numerator issues and denominator issues when you talked about crises. And when we talk about healthcare consuming a higher and higher percent of the healthcare, uh, of the overall government uh, uh, spending or, or budget, uh, we have to keep in mind that. Uh, uh, if the denominator is shrinking, but the numerator is staying close to the same, you'll get an increase in that percentage of cost. Before we really focus on whether we're achieving the triple aim and how we're measuring performance of our triple aim, my argument is that we need to reset the sights. And I, wanna, I want you to picture a target. If, in fact, the triple aim means we're not focusing periodically on one aim and then another and then another, but balancing our aim. The idea should be that we're focused in on a target, on a balanced target, and we're paying equal attention to these three aims. But just like in looking at a target, if your sight is off, it may be that you're consistently shooting uh, to only one section of the target. So what happens if your aim is out of balance and if most of the time you're looking at cost? Well, if cost then holds patient care and experience and population health hostage, it can lead to uh, fixed publicly funded budgets or capped increases. There can be the assumption that hospital care and treatment services must be the first to be funded and lead to a slow erosion of patient experience and population health. It can lead to the erosion of publicly funded care with more and more service provided by private care, private insurance, or increasing overall costs. And it can lead to expensive whole population interventions with fewer and fewer marginal returns and actually a paradoxical decrease in the health status of the population. What if the aim is a bit fixed 
or uh, uh, out of balance over toward the experience side. So patient care, um, perhaps, uh, uh, or patient experience and, and provider experience starts to hold cost and population health hostage. Well, here we can get uh, demands from providers, whether it be for uh, provider uh, income, whether it be for certain types of uh, standards of drugs or diagnostic services in one area of the system uh, being looked at as a silo. And it can actually start to um, provide almost a, a hostage-taking situation where the providers are holding both the public and government hostage and saying we're going to uh, uh, threaten to withhold services or or um, uh, speak to the media about things unless our demands are met. Patients, on the other hand, can also demand everything the system can provide for themselves or for their family member without any thought toward uh, how escalating costs can have an impact on others in society. And you can get, you know, obviously uh, 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 an extreme in here where you can say if, if you could provide the entire health resources for me and my family, for the whole province, surely that would be the ultimate for me individually. Well, of course that's not going to happen. Well, how much of the pot for any individual uh, uh, type of, of sickness or, or treatment service, how much of that total pot should any one part of the system have? And as soon as we start talking about a little more balance and opportunity costs and start thinking about both individual and societal needs in balance, we start shifting that aim back to the center. So in short, um, evidence-based practice can start to become secondary to patient or provider demands if this aim is shifted, and short-term crisis management can blind people to the need to invest in the future through population health. Similarly, if population health holds cost and experience hostage, you can start uh, with rhetoric like population uh, health promotion and prevention can always trump care or treatment no matter the evidence or the relative return on investment uh, in this area. There can be a tendency to blame the victim uh, since if we provide the environment to be healthy and we've invested in prevention, uh, if you then choose to go against that, uh, you pay the consequences and pay for your own care. We can have uh, uh, Eventual illness, of course, and sickness and death that has to occur at some point. We can't uh, prevent death in all circumstances. So eventually treatment costs and experience issues catch up with you and you still have to deal with it. Uh, but again, with more of this expensive care than being paid for by out-of-pocket or more expensive private insurance. Now, I just caution that in terms of all of these different uh, uh, threats to unbalanced aims, this last one is uh, highly theoretical because I can't really think of any system where we've had an imbalance in population health. So pursuing the triple aim really is about balance. Uh, we need to have all three aims in balance. We need to protect that balance. And then we need to decide how big of an investment are we looking for. So again, going back to our diagram here, um, if the cost, uh, each circle, represents a larger investment, um, if you keep the balance, even if the investment is relatively small, between these three and then decide, okay, well, we're not covering enough of population health or cost or experience, we need to spend a little bit more as a society, uh, then you enlarge the circle and the cost goes up. But society has to continually have this discussion around how much are we willing to invest in the system overall, and as managers of the system, uh, what we need to do is make sure that regardless of the cost of that investment, uh, we try to keep the investment in balance. So what does that really look like? Um, I have a few things written here. I won't go through them all because I want to get to uh, the population health side. But um, specifically, if you have uh, uh, population health data, is one thing, but how do you use that data? You don't just need access to data, you need to use population health information as a perspective or a way of thinking in decision making, in management, in our care delivery, or even as a philosophy of care. So really, if you're thinking from this societal perspective and in this balanced perspective, you'd look at it in terms of the salaries in healthcare. 
From a cost perspective, you may be looking at how do we provide care the cheapest, and it may be, of course, that that might mean uh, outsourcing some of our costs to providers who can provide it cheaper. But what if the, the result is that a larger and larger proportion of those support services are paid for at a level that people can't even live above the poverty rate? Is that really true to a population health perspective and providing the right kind of experience to our providers? So there is this idea of at least being able to pay to a level of uh, a living wage, not just necessarily minimum wage if those two aren't the same. What if we started um, uh, asking physicians, obviously, or, or if physicians started acting more responsibly in our ordering of tests, and I include myself in this, tests and drugs and being aware of the opportunity costs on the rest of the system from unnecessary testing, perhaps in my specific area of interest? What if we funded the system starting with evidence-based preventive and primary care and then started adding interventional care according to how much society is willing to pay, including that means test for advances in new drugs, equipment, or tests? Or in short, what if we started monitoring and evaluating health spending as a societal investment and not just as a cost and base that on outcomes and evidence? So I recently published a paper dealing with um, how to integrate a population health approach or, or population health data into health system planning and decision making. And I suggested three levels of use, one of which is at that basic program or departmental level. So if you have a part of the health system that is dealing almost exclusively in population health, like perhaps uh, some aspects of primary care and public health, Obviously, the data is going to be very useful for them in their health system planning and decision making. But at the next level, how about using more of the population health data for broader health system planning and for quality improvement? So for planning and monitoring the quality of treatment and rehabilitative services and programs. But also at that strategic level or the level of senior leadership for planning and prioritizing health system programs and services overall. So I'll just give you a few examples of this. And uh, the first is in health status monitoring. A lot of uh, regions are trying to do health status reports now, and that's more than just producing a bunch of statistics on what makes people sick, but is starting to look at uh, recommendations for areas of relative need for change within the system or for policies. And uh, within Saskatoon, for example, we'll produce a report every few years coming from the medical health officer's office through the legislation for public health that requires the MHO to give a health status report for the region. And to me, it's like uh, the recommendations are like the prescription pad at a population health level. What is the prescription for society on how to uh, improve health? And I won't go through all the detail. It could be a few hours talk on itself as to what to do in, in an effective health status report. But there's maps, there's graphs, there's trend lines. And what you're trying to do here is show a picture of uh, health and illness within a community, looking at determinants of health from both the healthcare system and outside the system. Where are the trends going and what are the types of programs or services that others have tried uh, evidence-based that can actually turn things around for the population or subgroups in the population. The second area is in uh, using population health monitoring activities within performance monitoring. And looking here at um, across the continuum of care, uh, a balance between the needs of patients, providers, and population and the best value for money. So these can be through quality reports, performance dashboards, et cetera. I've just taken an excerpt here out of our performance dashboard showing a few of the areas where we've started dabbling and trying to at least get some population health data in front of our board and our senior leadership on a quarterly basis to say, are we improving in our uh, uh, mortality rates, in our uh, hospital standardized mortality ratio, or immunization coverage rates, and now recently introducing a deprivation index ratio saying, are we immunizing our poor residents as well as our rich residents and trying to improve that, that equity dimension in our preventive services. And this information is provided in trends as well to say, is our coverage rate going up overall, first of all, so a measure of prevention, and then secondly, is that disparity ratio going down? Are we uh, not just immunizing 
to improve that uh, coverage rate in only one sector of the population. And so here you can see that with a, a focus at trying to improve overall coverage, but also preferentially uh, within the poorer neighborhoods, we're seeing both an increase in immunization and a decrease in the disparity ratio. Health equity audits or impact assessments are another area where population health perspectives can be applied to health system planning and quality improvement. And this is basically to ensure in our efforts at quality improvement, again, we're not leaving some groups behind. And um, there are a lot of different ways to do this. In our case, we've developed a healthcare equity audit approach that has a cycle where, first of all, you have to be able to look at health uh, system utilization in terms of uh, different subgroups of the population. It may be gender, it may be by geography like urban, rural, it may be by socioeconomic status or age or ethnicity, and compare the access and the outcomes of patients in these different subgroups to see if in fact you're getting equal service for equal need. And in many cases, although uh, at an overall level we seem to be improving, we find out that certain subgroups uh, actually uh, are doing less well off as we make quality improvement initiatives based only on a whole, uh, on an average situation. So once you find if there are inequities, then you prioritize areas for quality improvement so that uh, you can decrease those inequities, triangulating results from the literature, uh, from what's been shown to work elsewhere, but selectively by talking to the patients involved and the providers to say why isn't the system working for cer certain subgroups in the population. So this cyclical approach, uh, just as an example again with immunization, we uh, applied in our health region. When we first looked at the data and saw that despite a, a program provided almost exclusively by public health throughout the system, we were getting age-appropriate coverage rates for measles, mumps, and rubella uh, at about uh, 75 to uh, 80 percent in our rich neighborhoods, but only 46 percent in our poor neighborhoods. And by studying that and figuring out what some of the barriers were from a provider perspective, from a system perspective, from a patient perspective, we instituted some changes, and you can see over, over the years that gap starting to narrow as we make successive um, iterations of this quality improvement tool. And we've now uh, also started instituting this in acute care with some surgical services, some uh, medicine services like uh, diabetes care and in psychiatry and in home care. And again, doing these successive quality improvement cycles to uh, reduce inequities. Also in health system performance indicators, uh, the ones that we choose in our data sets, um, we need to include population health data and prevention information. So. Uh, recently, there's been an introduction in Canada of trying to get avoidable and uh, mortality, which is preventable and treatable mortality, or by uh, potential years of life lost, introducing health-adjusted life expectancy, and stratifying many of the access and outcome indicators by social determinants of health so that we get a better idea uh, on a systematic basis how the system is performing for all parts of society and therefore look at it from a population health perspective. Also targeting programs and services then to those subgroup needs and incorporating prevention and promotion components. Um, requiring community needs assessments for new programs that go into various aspects of the community. And uh, as I said, using population health data for health system strategic planning uh, for accreditation uh, has been a recent Canadian uh, innovation. Some of the use uh, challenges are that uh, if you want to incorporate pop health and, and prevention concepts into criteria used in prioritization processes for investment or reduction, the reality is that a lot of that data isn't linked um, into planning and, and budget cycles, so that we look at the data for planning purposes, but when it comes time to allocate budget, that data is forgotten about, and uh, uh, it seems that a, a different set of data is used in making budget decisions. Uh, we have increasingly forecasting tools, but um, often there isn't a lot of capacity or the user interfaces 
aren't very good. And this is a good example of a friend of mine, uh, Nate Osgood, in uh, University of Saskatchewan, is working with a variety of micro simulation tools where you get a user interface like this where a decision maker can plug numbers in and you don't have to know all the math behind this, but it's basically working at uh, evidence-based practice and trends so that you can show what the relative impact is of uh, investing in one type of service versus another. Uh, very useful for health system planners. And lastly, uh, applying population health perspectives to health system problems. And again, not all senior leadership teams include someone on uh, their team who is a population health specialist, and not all the population health specialists are trained to think in the system-wide approach. But increasingly, we need that perspective at the table if you want to get more balance in, uh, uh, in our triple aims. And this is just one example from a, a paper that I recently heard presented by Fran Baum, suggesting that if you look at the same problem and the same issue from an individual level versus a population level, there might be entirely different questions that get asked. And it's not saying that one is right and one is wrong, but once again, in balance, we need to be considering as a system, how are we dealing with preventing smoking both at an individual level, but how are we also changing the population level, social and economic environment so it discourages smoking? Or uh, for depression, how do we best counsel individuals, but why? Asking why is it that teens in a certain area have increasing rates of depression thoughts and suicidal tendencies, and what can be done to change this at a community level? So these population level questions are often different and both need to be discussed as a health system. So just in closing, um, I would suggest that uh, the, a lot of the next steps that are required for improving our capacity to deal with population health data have really been articulated in the Senate report from a few years ago on population health, suggesting ways to improve collection, monitoring and reporting of population health data by the whole health system. And it does require relatively small investments in analytic capacity and data systems. In our region, we've uh, put in a population health observatory as an example uh, to complement our health service utilization uh, monitoring unit so that we get that type of perspective and data in our planning and evaluation. Uh, certainly broad application of the elements of health promotion, not just in public health, uh, but in other parts of the system. And remembering that that means sometimes advocacy and start, you know, things get a little uncomfortable sometimes when you start pushing on population health issues and uh, we need board and administrative support even when that gets a bit uncomfortable. Uh, adopting health promoting, uh, health promotion standards in hospitals and uh, Europe is a lot farther ahead than we are it seems in Canada in taking a health promoting hospitals approach and I just refer you there to a WHO Europe project that sets out standards for hospitals uh, and there are a few pilot centers in Toronto and Montreal trying to do this in Canada. Uh, what does it mean when a hospital starts taking a health promotion approach and starts looking at overall needs of their patients, not just the need they're presenting for at this specific time? And uh, advocacy, of course, for improvements in social determinants of health. Health is, in fact, consuming over 40% of the budget. Um, the other parts of the system really appreciate it when health steps up and says, you know, you need to keep things in balance and make investments in other parts of the system for people to be truly healthy. So I'll just close with saying that uh, a good quote uh, is, a society is judged on how it treats its most vulnerable, and I think a health system should probably be judged by that same metric. Thank you.